everyone for coming along tonight. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm going to be talking about my personal experience of having an eating disorder. The way I talk about my experience is very honest. Um, the content shouldn't be triggering to anyone, but if there's anything that I say that bothers you, do feel free to grab me afterwards, um, and I'm happy to kind of chat over it with you um, if that is helpful for you. So my story began on the 8th of May in 1990. I grew up in Bristol. I was one of five children. Didn't have a particularly challenging upbringing. Everyone kind of got along, functioned, and seemed quite happy. Quite a busy family, but that was kind of always fun and always good. When I was nine years old, I got my first lot of therapy. For some reason, I found it really difficult to express any sort of emotion. Whether it was happiness, whether it was sadness, there was something in my brain that didn't quite click. And so once a week, on a Thursday lunchtime, I used to leave school and go and do an hour of therapy. The therapist would get me to draw pictures, write down bad habits on pieces of paper and put them in a tissue box. And every single week, I would sit there and think, what is the right answer? What should and shouldn't I be saying? What would my friends be saying in this situation? After about six months of doing that, nothing had changed for me. I thought it was a complete waste of time, if I'm honest. So I went back to school, kind of carried on through the rest of junior school, and then hit senior school. And that's when things got a little bit more difficult for me. My older brother, who is now one of the nicest people in the world, back when I was growing up, he was very angry a lot of the time. And he got quite angry with my dad a lot of the time. They fought a lot. He ran away from home, ended up in A&E a couple of times. And I took it as my responsibility to try and fix this situation and to try and make everything OK for anyone. Around that time as well, I was sexually abused for around eight, nine months. And throughout that whole period of time, I didn't want to talk to anyone about it. I felt really guilty and really ashamed that it had happened. And so instead of trying to talk about it and instead of trying to find the words to explain it, I just buried everything away. And that was when I started to hear this voice in my head. And that voice was my anorexia. And it became like having this best friend with me the entire time. It gave me this value and sense of purpose that I wasn't getting from anywhere else. And I thrived off it. It started off really slowly with kind of the odd meal here and there. I already did a lot of sport at school, so kind of upped all of that. But the more I did it, the better I felt. And I thrived off that feeling of achievement every single day the more I listened to it. And if I didn't listen to it enough, that voice in my head kind of got cross with me, told me that I needed to try a little bit harder. And so I then knew I had to just up my game a little bit, work harder to make that voice happy. And that if I did that, somehow everything would be OK and life would just be perfect and brilliant for me. I managed to hide that relationship for the next four years, not telling anyone about it. I became quite secretive, very devious, and managed to just hide everything that I was doing. There was a couple of times throughout that four-year period when I thought something wasn't quite right with me. And one of them was when I went away with my school friends after our GCSEs. We had a week of drinking and going out for food. And I couldn't get my head around the fact that everyone was totally OK to eat what they wanted to and drink what they wanted to because there was something in my brain that just wouldn't let me do that. And after that week away, I didn't really want to see any of my friends. I didn't want to have anything to do with them because I know if I spent time with them, that voice in my head would start nagging me and telling me that I shouldn't be doing what they're doing. I shouldn't be eating. I should be out exercising all the time. After that summer holidays, I went back to school and my school got in touch with my mum and I ended up going to my GP and then going to the Child Adolescent Mental Health Services back in Bristol where I grew up. I went to CAMS for the next six months, still not really sure what was the matter with me. I didn't really understand why I was there, and I was in this complete denial phase. All of the clinicians kept telling me that I had this thing wrong with me called anorexia. And to me, people with anorexia were stick thins, they looked like skeletons, and I didn't think I looked like that. So I just completely shut down in every single session, every single week. I'd sit there opposite the therapist, telling them that I was fine, life was fine, everything was just fine, and I wanted to just carry on and do things the way I wanted to do them. Throughout my time at CAMS, I became very good at tricking the system. Every single Tuesday, I had an appointment, and my mum would pick me up at about 2.15, and I had this 15-minute window where I pre would prepare myself for the session. And for me, that meant going into the locker room at school, drinking litres and litres of water, so that when I got to my appointment, my weight would have either stayed the same or it had gone up. And I was brilliant at it. I was literally perfect at just getting it right every single week. And I loved the fact that like, no one knew what was going on in my head and that no one would then be able to take away this one thing that I really wanted to be friends with for the rest of my life. There was one week, five months after I'd been at CAMS, when my mum came and got me a little bit too early. 
I got into the car next to her and felt so stressed, really unsure of what was going to happen. I knew that as soon as I got to the hospital, everyone was going to find me out. And exactly that. I arrived, got weighed, and within about five minutes, everyone knew that for the last five, six months, I'd been lying to everyone constantly about my weight loss. What followed was four weeks of utter hell. I argued constantly with my mum whenever she tried to make me to eat. I tried to go to the gym at all hours, and if I did, they'd contact my mum, which would then cause another massive family argument. I turned into this really nasty person, just doing everything I could not to eat. And then the evenings when I was too tired to argue with my mum about whether I was going to have anything to eat, I'd eat my dinner really quickly, go upstairs to the bathroom, lock the door, turn on the shower, and then spend the next couple of hours making myself sick, making sure that every single bit of food was out of my body. And it was those evenings that I felt completely isolated. I felt completely alone. I had no one to talk to about this. I didn't think anyone understood what it was like. But the frustrating thing was that the next morning, I'd then wake up and that anorexic voice would be back in my head, cheering me on, telling me what I should be doing today, telling me that I needed to skip the next meal, telling me that everything would be OK again. And then six months after I'd started at CAMS, my heart nearly stopped. And I was admitted to a mental health hospital, where I then spent the next year of my life trying to recover. So trying to eat again, trying to learn about exercise. And the biggest one of all was actually just learning to talk about how I really felt. The really frustrating thing about anorexia that I've already touched on is that quite often people don't think there's anything the matter with them. You don't understand that you're really unwell and you are in this constant denial phase. And when I arrived in that hospital, I walked through the front door and still did not understand why I was there. I didn't understand why people were trying to take away this thing that made me feel so good. After three days in the hospital, I was completely fed up. I'd pretty much spent the entire time lying in bed or being encouraged to eat, which for an anorexic person who's obsessed with exercise, it was the worst combination in the world. One of the nurses came in to see me, and she got me to draw how I imagined myself on these massive pieces of brown paper. She then got me to lie down on that exact same piece of paper, and she traced around the outside of me. She then got me to stand up and look back down on the floor at that piece of paper. And the images were just so, so different. I thought she'd somehow lied to me, that she tricked me, that something had gone a little bit wrong. But the reality was at that point, I had this realization that something wasn't quite right with my brain and I had to do something to make it okay again. And it wasn't 100% plain sailing after that. It was really hard work. It's really hard work that with an eating disorder, your weight seems to go up and mentally you're still really struggling. That people think that because you're physically healthy, that somehow mentally you are totally fixed. So I had to really learn to talk about how I felt much more and actually start to express myself in other ways. So apart from all the talking and the therapy that I had, the other two big things that really helped me in hospital was the first one was exercise. So after I'd been in hospital for about nine months, I was allowed to go out for one 20-minute run a week with one of the nurses. And it was this moment that every single week I would long for and like look forward to all the time, just holding on to this fact that I could feel like this normal person again, running outside, getting my life back on track. And then the next thing was thinking about my motivations for getting well. So when you have anorexia, you think that you're completely invincible. You think that your life will just carry on and that everything will be totally OK and that everything will just work out perfectly. But the reality is, if you don't tackle it head on, yes, you can function for a very long time with an eating disorder, but you can't live your life to the full. And actually, there will be a point when your life will be put on hold until you start to tackle it. And for me, I had to have this realization that there was so much I wanted out of life that wouldn't be possible unless I started to stop listening to that voice in my head and realize what a nasty, manipulative thing it actually was. And so for me, it was realizing the things I wanted to do. So traveling, I wanted to get a job one day. And the biggest one of all, which is something that actually still keeps me well now, is that I really want to have my own family one day. And none of this stuff will be possible unless I work on my recovery and keep going. So after that year in hospital, I went straight to university. And again, kind of learning to navigate this whole new kind of university lifestyle when two weeks before I'd come out of a mental health hospital. Unfortunately, I didn't get care um, at university just because of the whole transition between turning 18. But my mum came down quite a lot just to check that I was eating enough and kind of managing. And I was quite lucky because all my friends at uni were very supportive. They didn't question the fact that I had to go for dinner at six o'clock every evening or that I only ate my cereal bowl, cereal out of one cereal bowl that I'd taken from the hospital. And they just kind of adapted to it and accepted that was part of who I was. Then after uni, ran a couple of marathons, went traveling, got a job, and everything just seemed really good again. 
I felt like I was 100% fixed, that that voice in my head, this anorexic thing, was like a complete distant memory, and that everything was just going to be perfect for the rest of my life. I just loved going out for food, I wasn't calorie counting, and I didn't have this constant need to feel like I had to exercise all the time. But the really frustrating thing about mental health that I'm sure a lot of you will know is that if you don't manage it, if you don't know what your triggers are, if you don't kind of monitor yourself and keep a check on yourself, there is that chance that at any point it could come back. And unfortunately for me, in 2016, after being out of hospital for eight years, I relapsed. So my grandma had dementia for the last couple of years of her life. And towards the end of her life, her memory was getting very bad. When I was with her, she didn't know who I was, but she still had a really good time. And I was kind of always left with that kind of happy feeling that, yes, we were having a good time together, and it didn't matter that she didn't know who I was. Just before she passed away, she got put into a care home. And I went down to see her on the Friday and had a really bad visit with her. I didn't want to be there. I was in a really bad mood. I was not being patient that day with her. She was hallucinating a lot. And after about an hour and a half of being there, I asked my mum to take me back to the station so that I could go back to London. The entire way back to London, I felt really guilty about it. I kept saying to myself, I should have been more patient. I should have maybe tried a little bit harder, done something that she wanted to do. But I kept telling myself, it'll be fine. I'll be back next Friday. We'll have this really good visit. We'll go for a walk around the care home grounds. We'll read poetry, kind of do all the old stuff that we used to do. And I thought that it was all going to be OK. Unfortunately, on the following Wednesday, my mum rung me first thing, and I went straight up to Oxford. But I didn't have that final visit with my grandma. And I struggled with it so, so much. I became fixated on the reason that I hadn't got there in time was because I'd been for a run that morning and hadn't run quite fast enough. And I completely blamed myself for it. I battled with all this grief and all of this guilt and all of this emotion that I didn't really know what to do with it. But I knew one thing <clears throat> is that I did not want to feel that emotion anymore. And that was when that voice came back in my head. That relentless nagging of that anorexic voice telling me that if I just stopped eating, if I exercised a bit more, that somehow the whole situation would just sort itself out, that everything would be okay. I battled for the next four months, not really knowing what to do about it, knowing that deep down, I didn't want to listen to that voice in my head, that I didn't want to end up in adult services. But at the same time, I was back to kind of thriving off it, knowing that if I did listen to it, if I missed a meal maybe one or two days a week, it wouldn't be the end of the world, and it would make my emotions feel much, much better. After a couple of months, my mum came down to London to see me, and we went shopping. And halfway through the shop, my mum confronted me on the fact that I'd lost a bit of weight and I hadn't really been that engaged. Had my mum done that to me 10 years before, I would have completely shut her down. I would have shouted at her, told her that I wanted nothing to do with her, told her that it was all a load of rubbish, that it was lies. But actually, I really needed someone that day to reach out to me and to ask me what I, what, what I was going to do about it and whether I was OK. I promised my mum that day that I'd refer myself to mental health services. So the next morning, got up, rang my GP, and managed to get a referral to the eating disorder unit in southwest London, where I live. Got an appointment a couple of weeks later. But unfortunately, with the way the NHS runs their eating disorder services, despite all the guidance and the training that they have, if you're not underweight, there's actually very, very little support available for you. So I turned up at this appointment, gave my whole back history everything, only to be told that my BMI wasn't quite right and that they couldn't do anything for me. I left that appointment and felt like this completely fake anorexic person. I didn't know what I was going to do anymore. I felt like people were laughing at me, like this voice was back shouting at me, telling me that I was just attention-seeking, that I was making it up, that I was just rubbish at being anorexic. For the next four weeks, I battled a lot with my mood. I'd get up in the morning and go to the gym. I'd then get on the tube to work go all the way to the office crying, get into work, put on my makeup, and then put on this whole face for the entire day. Go home in the evening, maybe work out a little bit more, and then get into bed. And I was just emotionally and physically exhausted every single evening. And I didn't know what I was going to do about it anymore. There was one evening when I was walking home from work. So I used to work up by the Tower of London, and I'd walk all the way back down the South Bank to Waterloo Station. And I was just walking down the South Bank, kind of looking around at everyone around me. People were drinking beer, eating ice cream. And I was thinking, God, my brain will never, ever let me do that. I can't just go out for an ice cream after work. I'm exhausted. I don't know what I'm going to do. I was angry at myself, and I felt like this completely weak person. I felt like I'd let 
every single person down around me for the fact that I'd spent this year in hospital, but for some reason couldn't manage myself and couldn't manage to stay well. I got to Waterloo Station and walked through the platform and then sat on the um, platform for the next couple of hours, completely lost in my own world. I didn't know what I was going to do. All I wanted to do at that point was to completely give up. I felt like everyone else would be so much better off if I wasn't here, that people wouldn't be constantly worrying about whether I was eating or what I was going to do with myself. Luckily, after a couple of hours, my little sister Molly rung me. She was doing her A-levels at the time, and she rung me to have a bit of a moan about her revision, her exams, and I realised at that point that actually if I ended my life that evening, she'd completely mess up her exams and probably wouldn't get to go to university, and I would have ruined her life as well. So I got on that train and went home and told myself that I could go back a couple of weeks' time when she'd finished her exams. Over the next week, I continued to really, really struggle with my mood, and I thought that the only way out of this was to go to my doctor. So I ended up going to my GP, and they put me on antidepressants. So for me, going on antidepressants was a, re- Sorry, I've got something in my eye. Was, um, a really scary thing to do. I thought it was going to completely change my mood, it was going to change who I am and everything about me. But I ended up doing it. And after about the first two weeks when I started to battle a lot with my mood and my emotions and kind of feeling really sick a lot of the time, I ended up... Sorry. Um, I ended up really sticking on it and then spent the next year and a half of my life trying to recover. So trying to actually get back on track with what I was doing and trying to realise that actually if I really focused on myself and focused on my kind of moving forward, everything would be okay. And after that year and a half of focusing more on that, getting myself a personal trainer, going back to the basics of meal planning and everything like that, I was actually able to start to recover and actually start to focus on where I was at with things. I then booked myself a three-week holiday and came off my antidepressants really slowly over that time. So for me, my recovery is something that is ongoing. It's something that I have to manage. Yes, I don't have to manage it kind of every single day now. It's kind of a month-by-month thing. But it's something that I am still slightly conscious of. It's something now that has different things that I come up against. For example, I now talk very openly about my recovery. And it means that whenever I do any sort of talk, I know that every single person in the room, as soon as they hear that I'm talking about having anorexia, they will look me up and down and decide whether I look like I've got an eating disorder and whether I look thin enough to be anorexic. And the reality is I don't anymore, which is a real positive. But for me, it means that actually I'm probably now more conscious about my body image than I am about other things. But it's definitely something that I love now talking about and something actually I love to share my story much more. There are a couple of things I wanted to share just before I finish, things that really help me stay well, but things that I think actually help everyone else with our mental health, whatever we are on that spectrum that's been mentioned a couple of times tonight. So the first thing is exercise. So exercise for me was a massive part of my illness. It was something that I was so obsessed with all the time. It was something that I had to do, and if I didn't do it, I got really agitated. But it is now something that does keep me well. It's something that I use a couple of times a week to manage my recovery and keep me focused and give me that headspace. But it is something that I have to watch still. I recently cycled across the UK and doing kind of 90 miles a day cycling consistently for two weeks was a real challenge for me, not just because of the amount of cycling I'm doing, but also the amount of food that I have to eat to fuel my body. Since coming back, it's been a real challenge to actually realise that I don't have to exercise that much every day. And if I don't exercise that much, the whole world isn't just going to end. But it's just part of my recovery and part of pushing myself further on. I also know what my triggers are. So exercise is a trigger for me. But the other big trigger for me is calorie counting. So the really frustrating thing about having an eating disorder is you learn the calories of every single thing in the entire world. And then you just can never quite shake that information. But now I know that when I have days when I feel the need to calorie count everything that I'm having, and sometimes everything that other people are having around me, which is the most frustrating thing (laughs) in the world, it means that actually I have to start tackling other things that are affecting me head on and managing it that way instead. I also make sure that meal times and food times are enjoyable and there's no kind of negative emotion kind of at those times. Because for me, it's really important just to keep them kind of level and so that I don't start to feel the need to express myself in other ways. I also make sure that I avoid all diet magazines and all that healthy eating stuff that you read everywhere now. And the biggest one of all is I try and talk about how I feel. This is something that I do still find really difficult at times. It has its challenges from day-to-day basis, 
But actually, for me, it's about having people around me that I trust and that I can have check-in days with. And whether it is just sending a really quick text to my mum in the morning saying, I'm really struggling today, and that being it, knowing that no one can fix that situation, but by just telling someone, it makes everything okay. The final thing before I finished was I just wanted to do my own kind of plug for my campaign um, that Georgie's already mentioned, which is amazing. But I launched this campaign back in July following the experience that I had um, of being turned away from services for not being underweight enough. But this isn't something that just happened to me. It's something that happens to hundreds and hundreds of people every single day. I read just this morning, actually, that a girl who's 16 years old has unfortunately passed away because of her eating disorder because she also got turned away from services for not being thin enough. This actually has to change, and if it doesn't change soon, then more people are going to keep losing their lives to eating disorders and also not feeling able to reach out for the support and reach out when they need it. Eating disorders are not about weight. You can be physically healthy and still mentally really, really struggling. So it's important that we try and change this and actually make that long-term change so that other people do not get that same treatment when they go for services. So please do take two minutes out to just have a look at the campaign. And if you've got your own personal stories that you want to share, please do feel free to share them as well. Um, as I always love to hear kind of what other people are experiencing, whether it's good or whether it's bad as well. But thank you, everyone, for listening to me. Um, I hope you found it interesting and insightful. And if anyone's got anything they want to ask me um, kind of afterwards in the nibbly networking bit, do feel free to grab me. <laughs> I didn't really know what to call that bit. <laughs> that's the new name for it. Um, so yeah, that section. Or if you want to ask me anything that you don't feel able to ask me today, do feel free to contact me as well. But thank, thank you. you.